you feel like your score is just stuck, then this might be why. Early on when I first started studying for the MCAT, I did what I think a lot of you are probably doing. I, I read the Kaplan books. I go on and read it and they'd be like, well, the blueprint book is better for this section. So I go read that. I, you know, I was taking Jack Weston passages and all that stuff. And I was just so busy and I was doing so many things. But the one thing I was not doing was improving my score. So it was really upsetting because I felt like regardless how much effort or activity, I just wasn't getting closer to my goal. And I realized that I was making a really common mistake. And so let me illustrate that mistake. You know how whenever you go to a restaurant and you get up there and you're like, yeah, I want a table for three people and y'all are just at Chili's. You're at Chili's with a couple friends and they're like, oh, it's going to be an hour wait. And you just look at your buddies and you're like, should we leave? Now, the reality is that if the goal is to eat, then the fastest way to eat is probably just to stay there and wait an hour right? Because by the time you leave that restaurant, drive to a different restaurant, put your name on their waiting list, and then actually get a table, even if that waiting list is shorter, aka even if that MCAT plan is better, you would have gotten food faster if you had just waited and stuck with the place that you chose originally. And so in MCAT language, we're not talking about enjoying a nice triple dipper, which I'm a fan of myself, but what we're talking about is getting a good MCAT score, right? And the worst thing that you can do probably probably or the the thing that gets people caught up studying for the MCAT for years rather than months is the idea of switching between different approaches. And the reason that that's so dangerous is because it it makes the fallacy that the MCAT is about sciences, right? And it's not true. Like the MCAT is a problem-solving test in the language of sciences. So yeah, you have to speak the language to take the test. You have to know the sciences in order to speak the language so you can take the problem solving test. But the reason you're not improving is usually not that you don't know the sciences, even though sometimes it is. But if you've done a whole, if you've read a whole book or you've done a whole lecture series or something like that, it's not that you don't know the sciences. I mean, you learned them once in undergraduate. It's usually that you don't know how to do the problem solving portion because that's the hard part. I mean, everybody that's in that testing room with you, I think of the people that you know that are studying for the MCAT. Like there's smart people that did well in undergraduate in all the pre-med classes. They can do sciences. It's the problem solving portion that's hard. And if you're constantly switching between different prep approaches, if you're constantly going to different restaurants, just putting your name on a waiting list, hunting a shorter and a shorter and a shorter waiting list, it's gonna take you a really, really long time to eat. Or it's gonna take you a really, really long time to get a good MCAT score. And the scary part, is that most people don't just switch once. Like those people that switch, they don't just switch once. They switch to a thousand different places. And so you can imagine you're not going from one restaurant to another. You go to one restaurant and they say it's an hour. You go to the next one and they say 30 minutes. And you go to the next one and they say 30 minutes. And then you go to the next one and they also say 30 minutes before you realize that there is a time cost. I do have to wait for this to happen and the fastest I can do it is in 30 minutes. But by the time you figure that out, it's been three hours already. You could have already eaten, paid, been at home, changed it to your comfies. And people do this with the MCAT too. And so the reason that people do it is because they're trying to minimize the things that suck for the MCAT. And with good reason, I mean, that's how we built all of our programs is we were like, what are the things that suck about the MCAT that don't actually increase scores? And we cut all those out. But the truth of the matter is that like, if, if you're already, making progress on a specific study plan, you should just stick to that study plan. And I want you to buy our stuff, right? Like <laughs> I'll take all the money you want to give me, <laughs> but it's probably faster if you just stick to what you're doing. And if you don't know what you should switch to, let me just make it very straightforward for you. Like studying for the MCAT is about getting a deep conceptual understanding of the frequently tested topics and the concepts, memorizing the small details. I like Anki flashcards for that. That's how we do it in our program. And then getting two or three times as many practice questions as you think you need. Because these two things, the, con the conceptual understanding and the detail memorization, that's the language, right? That's the sciences. That's the language you have to speak. But then all the, the, the practice questions and stuff like that and the strategies that we teach on the channel and the strategies that you'll learn and practice by doing practice passages, that's the problem solving portion. That's the hard portion. And you have to get to that. If you don't feel like your program is giving you that, then yeah, you should switch. But if you see that 
methodology within your program, like probably just stick it out. And most of you watching this video know that that's the case, right? You know that you should be doing, you know, those three or four things to study for the MCAT. But if that's the what to do, then the important question is to ask, why is it not happening? And I feel like I've narrowed it down to two things, resistance, and expectations. So the concept of resistance comes from this book that I read called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. And it's this, uh, it's a book for creatives or people that want to do like an entrepreneurial journey like I'm doing. And the idea is that anytime there's something that's self-directed, meaning you're not being assigned and somebody's like making you do it. So that can include studying as well as, you know, a bunch of other things. There's going to be this like internal friction to getting started. And once you get started, it usually gets easier. And, and not only does it happen with like beginning your studying, I mean, like how many of you have been like, oh, I'll start MCAT studying in January and now it's June and you're watching a video about how to do it, right? Like, so there's friction to get started, but there's also friction every single day. And so the book is all about seeing resistance as the enemy, acknowledging that it's there and taking steps to minimize it every day. And so in MCAT language, I've separated resistance into two subtopics, friction and distractions. For friction, that is anything that makes it harder for you to study every single day. And so for me, that was having my Xbox on my desk. I had to put it up in the closet. It was keeping my phone near me. That's probably the freaking biggest one. Like put your phone in a different room or throw it across the room. And if you're anxious that you're gonna miss a call from somebody, just like get over it, it's, it's okay. And then you also have to do things like put your, I know all of us, most of us have Macs. And so we get text messages on our computers. So put it on do not disturb and remove the messages icon from your dock. That, those are things that I did. I also tried to, focus on like studying in the same place, getting away from individuals and finding like a study safe place. And so for some people that may look like a coffee shop, I find that a little bit distracting. What I really, really had to do, especially in medical school, was just like not be near family or friends that weren't on the same journey. Because friends that were on the same journey that were serious about it, I could sit down, we could study in the same room, and if I had a question, I could spitball it off of him. But if it's someone that's just like not doing the same thing, they don't understand the difficulties of this process, you know, studying alone is better. It actually allows you to spend more time with your family and friends because you can get, if you can have six concentrated hours of studying, that's probably enough, not only for MCAT, but also for medical school. Like there's plenty of people that sit down and study for 12 hours a day, but it's like, you spend a lot of time on TikTok and you spend a lot of time texting and you know, just doom scrolling or, or whatever. And so I would isolate myself. I would throw my phone across the room. I would not have any distractions or any easily accessible distractions actions and I also kept like a little notepad next to me because there's like random things that pop in my brain like oh I need to call my air conditioning guy and I would just jot those down so that when I had a study break then I could take care of those tasks but there is a cost to switching tasks right like if you're studying and you're in the zone like you're there you're making progress but the the second that you're like oh I just need to make this five minute phone call it doesn't cost you five minutes it costs you switching it finding the number calling them the five minute conversation and then it costs you like the 15 minutes it takes you to get back in the rhythm so it's like actually a 30 minute expense for something that's a five minute task. So I, I just jot all those downs and I take care of them all at once uh, after I'm done studying. So the first component of resistance is friction. The second component of resistance is distractions. And so yeah, this is like some of the bull crap like social media and stuff like that. But I think the more insidious distractions, what I'm really talking about are two things. One of them is comparisons of your study approach to other people's study approach and your progress to other people's progress because like people progress at different rates and what works for somebody else like it probably would work for you but you may not like it as much and so like that also just kind of takes you back to the restaurant example of like if you see your buddy peter doing something really well or he's doing well on his MCAT and he's studying a completely different way from you. If you're already on one path, you should just stay on your path and just be like, Peter, that's awesome. Like I'm doing this and you're doing this and we're both gonna succeed. And then the distraction that's like a hot take and I am really passionate about this is extracurriculars. I don't like it whenever people load up their MCAT studying time with extracurriculars. And I know you feel like you have to, I've been you, 
but it doesn't matter how many shadowing hours you have or how many times you volunteered at the food shelter. Those are really good things, but none of that matters if you have a low MCAT score. And I can prove it to you. For those of you who don't know me, my name's John. I just graduated medical school. I'm going to start my plastic surgery residency in like a month. I took the MCAT four times. And so I made a 502 twice, mostly because I was doing this switching thing and just falling prey to like the content trap of thinking that more and more content means higher and higher score. It's just not true. Then I made a 509 after I bought one of those like $5,000 prep courses. And then I dedicated myself to figuring out the MCAT and I just learned all the stuff that I put into our courses. And that's when I made a 90th percentile score. Now, I applied to medical school three times. So I applied once with a 502, once with a 509, once with my 90th percentile score. I got rejected with a 502 and the 509 and I got a scholarship with the 90th percentile score. And the truth of the matter is that not much changed in my application between the 509 and the 90th percentile score. So you go from getting rejected to getting a scholarship just with your standardized exam. If that's not convincing enough, here's another example. For plastic surgery residency, there were several people in my class that wanted to do plastics and most of them took the advice of our mentors, which was you need to study for step as fast as you can. Step two is like the big, uh, it's like the MCAT for residency, how well you score on it dictates how competitive you are for specific specialties like plastics or dermatology or something like that, as well as where you can go to residency if you're doing something a little bit less competitive. And so they rushed step two and started their plastic surgery rotations early with the idea of, oh, I can get more letters of recommendation because I'll have more places I can rotate through through. And I've just been burned by standardized tests. I made a whole YouTube channel and business around one standardized exam. And so I have, I had a theory. I was like, I just really think that the standardized test is the only thing that matters or it's the main thing that matters. And so I, instead of taking, you know, three weeks, four weeks to study for the MCAT, or to study for step two, I took like two plus months and I just made sure that I murdered it and I did. And yeah, that meant I had less letters of recommendation. I just made sure I got good ones from the ones I could get. And I was the only one to match into plastic surgery. And it's not because I'm smarter than those people because I'm probably not in all honesty, but it's because I kept the main thing, the main thing. So whatever you're doing in life, keep the main thing, the main thing, the standardized exam, is the main thing. Regardless what your advisors tell you, I'm telling you as a friend, the standardized exam is what matters. Everything else is icing on the cake. The second reason that this is not happening is because of expectations. And so most people are really poor at setting expectations, uh, myself included. And if you don't have proper expectations set for what you're about to do, then your brain is going to default to this idea that the task I'm about to take on is probably the same as the task I just took on, which is wrong. The MCAT is a lot harder than undergraduate, right? And you know this. And so if you don't have proper expectations set and written down, let me just tell you, this process of becoming a doctor, this process of studying for the MCAT is going to be boring, painful, expensive, and discouraging. You're trying to be a doctor. So if you weren't aware of that before, and you're like, man, is this just like, do I just suck? Like, no, this process is boring, painful, expensive, and discouraging. And that's gonna be the case for any like high achieving career outcome that you want. Like if you wanna be a doctor or you wanna be a professional athlete, the whole thing is boring, painful, expensive, and discouraging. It is just the price to pay for the privilege of having a job that you really want and value. Now, if you have no clue where to start studying, we have free programs on our website, but the best thing to do is probably go to Informing Future Doctors slash Plan Your Prep, and I'll have a link to it in the description. We actually have an employee that works for us full time and his job is to meet with you all and help you figure out how you should be studying, just give you recommendations. And so I spent like several weeks full time with this individual, training him to kind of expand on his current understanding of the MCAT and, and make sure that his recommendations would be our recommendations. He's also really good about texting me if he has questions. So if you have no clue where to start, that's probably where I would start. It's just having a little planning Zoom call with Damon. And there'll be a link in the description. And it, it's worth noting that the only reason we can afford to pay someone whose only job is to meet with you, to meet with everybody on YouTube that wants to talk about the MCAT and just help them is because you all were purchasing our books and our courses. And so if you want books, courses, strategies, content, lectures, etc., taught by me or taught by the other tutor on this channel, Maggie, the links for that will be in the description as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.